So, Nick, we got a great episode today. Lots I want to get into. You know, it looks like we have some clarity for what's happening in the sphere for the main event. Right. Sean O'Malley versus Marab Dawalish Willie. And great that point. really, you know, sets the stage for what Umar just did against Corey Sanhagen. Want to get into a little bit of that as well. Also talk some Alex Pereira and look at UFC 305, which is DDP versus Izzy. You know, we haven't seen Adesanya in a long time since his loss to Sean Strickland, really. But, right. you know, there's some rumors out of his camp. Dan Hooker and others have said that he's big, he's strong, he's looking better than ever. But I, I think the best place to start is the fight that just took place, which is Umar Nurmagomedov. Right. I mean, this was his toughest challenge to date by a country mile. There was, you know, Umar was fighting guys that were outside the top 15. In in the case of Begzat Almakan, his last opponent prior to Corey, he was not even in the UFC. This was right. his first fight. Now, he's a very unique situation. Situation. He was an extraordinarily talented fighter that came over to the UFC, and I still think he's got a good future ahead of him in the UFC. Me too. But Corey Sanhagen was the number two guy. He's the guy that if you beat him, you put yourself in line for a title shot, and that's what the UFC matchmakers have been boasting this fight as, a number one contender's fight. Right. Corey Sanhagen versus Nemargamanov, the winner of the fight, fights the winner of Sugar versus Marab. Right. So first, I want to break down the fight itself and what you saw out of Umar that, you know, was impressive and what makes you think he might be able to actually become the champion. And then let's kind of speculate how would he look against Marab and also how would he look against Sugar because those are two completely different fights. But first things first, what was your take on the fight with Corey? I love the fight and it made sense to be the first, uh, the number one contender matchup for Marab versus Sugar. And I know we were promised this fight a little bit earlier in the year and it didn't happen but I'm so glad they preserved it and, and they still delivered on that fight because Corey Sanhagen like you said is the top guy he's on any given night he could be the UFC's world champion but you know he he does stub his toe and, and, and come up short in some of his major fights and they're all very competitive and whether they're controversial or like this Umar one not so controversial but still a very close and competitive fight it makes you realize okay this level that uh, Corey Sanhagen's at is clearly championship caliber. So if Umar Nurmagomedov is able to get his hand raised, regardless of what he did and uh, the path to the top of the division, uh, when you start to get into the names like Corey Sanhagen, people start to forget about like, oh, your resume is not so powerful. It's not so strong. Your strength of schedule hasn't been the best. Umar Nurmagomedov is one of those guys where they weren't trying to protect him. They weren't trying to save him. And you see people talk about sugar like that or Patty the Batty. They say the UFC is just protecting these guys, and so they can get a good rec record, get a good resume, get some highlights going, and then we'll, we'll launch them into the high-level fighters. Umar was one of those guys that was so dominant at the beginning of his career in the UFC that it's like, all right, let's just kind of clear a path for him. We don't really need to see him go through the rankings because we have a feeling he's kind of like Hamzat Jemayev. He, he's new in the new in the division, kind of newer for the sport, but he's clearly high level caliber fighter. So and nobody wanted to fight him either, which does add to, to the equation. Right, that's a whole other aspect of the fight game that people don't really see. The the backside is you know you get your phone call, your manager calls you, say, hey, you want to fight Umar Magomedov? off a lot of dudes were saying no thank you I'll, I'll pass send me another three names and i'll pick one of those so umar was kind of left just to fight whoever was willing to, to sign the dotted line and i really uh thought that Corey sanhagen would be the toughest matchup on the way to the title marab was clearly the the top guy even when aljo was the division uh divisions champion but he was just going to wait until aljo's time as the champ was over so he he wasn't really a problem for for umar to deal with so he was just making a beeline straight towards sugar sean He's doing some things to cause some drama and everything. I really did like the angle that they took where this is a number one contenders matchup. And when you look at the the, the championship fight at the Sphere that's about to take place, Sugar Sean versus Marab is a very intriguing matchup. And I will also say that if you look at the number one contender matchup that just happened, if Corey would have won, whoever wins between Sugar and Marab, that's an exciting fight. And if Umar won, which he did, Whoever he fights between Marab and Sugar is also a very interesting matchup for yeah. totally different reasons. So I, I do want to see where this all takes us, right? You, you never know what's going to happen in this sport. Anything can change at any moment. And I think Corey Sanhagen showed us really good takedown defense. He showed us how he's able to get back to his feet, even with a guy like Nurmagomedov all over him. And, you know, Mar Nurmagomedov was able to just implement more offense. And when you're fighting an entire fight, 
getting somebody off of you and just getting back to square one. Just get back to the fight. Get, get, get on your feet. Get him off you and try to score again. That's what Corey found himself having to do the entire fight. And when you're judging a fight, you have to say, okay, well, who's the guy that's bringing all the pressure, causing the fight to go where he wants it? And who's the guy that's having to defend that? And we call it like leading a dance, right? Only one person can lead the dance at a time. Umar led the dance for the entire uh, fight pretty much. So I, I, I liked what I saw about uh, out of Umar. I think it's a very difficult fight if Sugar Sean uh, w- beats M- Marab and has to fight Umar next. And I think that if Corey Sanhagen would have got his hand raised, it would have been a very interesting fight to see him with Sugar. But I just, I think we could probably see that later on in our careers or later on uh, down the road whenever yeah. things settle for them. Maybe they move up to 45. But Umar showed us that he's clearly the number one contender now. Marab is going to show us exactly what he can do. I think a lot of people think he's going to uh, give Sugar everything he can handle and then some with the grappling. But you saw Corey Sandhagen, who's just like Sugar Sean, a very high-level striker, and he's got his grappling, but that his bread and butter is on the feet. Sugar Sean's going to have to show us the same thing against Marab, and I think he's going to uh, rise to the occasion and, and show us some good wrinkles in his game. But... Umar is a slightly different style uh, grappler than Marab. They're both very tenacious and they know how to get the fight to the ground, but they do it in different ways. And if Marab, uh, if Umar goes out and does the same sort of thing that he did to Corey Sanhagen to a Sugar Sean O'Malley, you could watch the, the minutes get eaten up off the clock and then Sean's now fighting from behind, which he hasn't done yet in his UFC career. He's now having to chase and maybe make some mistakes or take some more risks to get his hand raised in the fight because when Umar, who's very good at winning minutes, winning moments, and winning rounds, starts to steal those from you, you have to start you know, taking a little bit more risk, get a little bit more uh, throw, throw caution to the wind and just start going out there because you know at some point you can't beat him on the decision, so you got to get him out of there so i really do think sugar sean it is a the, the fight with marab is a perfect setup for the umar fight that could potentially happen next uh, marab is not the same fighter as umar but like i said they're similar in a lot of ways and uh, if sugar can get past marab i have a, i really do like his chances against umar yeah well i'm going to give you my thoughts on the namargamentov performance okay. and then how i think he matches up against sean and marab but i'm going to give you a wrinkle that i think is more likely to happen okay um Umar showed us everything we needed to see to know that he's a championship caliber fighter. What's amazing is that he, he has the last name to Magomedov. You see Khabib in his corner, so you automatically, for most people that don't really love the sport and dive into the, the X's and O's of the, of the fighters like we do, they would just assume that he's probably a grappler who's working on his striking. That is not the case with Umar. He started out as a striker, right. and you know Abdulmanap and Khabib and all of them, Islam said, look, if you want to be a top-level mixed martial artist, you have to learn how to wrestle. And it would be very surprising to somebody that has never seen him or never heard that before to, to watch him fight and see how well he wrestles against high level grapplers, guys that do have wrestling experience, guys that have high level jujitsu like Corey Sandhagen does. And he just takes them down at, at with ease. He's not the guy who started at five years old in the, you know, in the elementary school wrestling program and worked his way up and, and, and wrestled D one. He's a striker who really took to wrestling extremely well. So I say that to say that I think he can hang with Sugar Sean on the feet to some degree. Right. Sean is, he's got that lights out power. Sean O'Malley is very precise. He can find his target. And if him and if Umar just decided to have a pure stand up fight with Sean, I think that would be a mistake of yeah. a game plan. But I do think Umar can get Sean to the ground. Now, Marab, and this might surprise you, I think Marab is a much easier fight for. Umar than Sugar Sean is. Ah, really? Because I think the grappling cancels itself out. Mm -hmm. And I think the Achilles heel for Marab is his striking. His striking is not the best. He's got arguably the best cardio and gas tank in all of the UFC. His wrestling and his, his his chain wrestling, how he can just string takedown attempts together is top notch. I mean, we saw that against Henry Cejudo, who's an Olympic gold medalist. You know, he was having problems getting taken down by, by uh, Marab. Right. But I think Umar can prevent the takedown. Yeah. And then Umar is just allowed to do what he wants to do on the feet. And I don't think on the feet it's very close between Umar and uh, Marab. I agree. So my prediction, if that fight were to be the one to take place, if, if Marab gets the jump on Sugar, is that Umar would actually defeat him. Yeah. Sugar versus Umar is a very interesting uh, proposition as well. I think that Umar has a very good chance of winning that fight. But now for the wrinkle, I don't believe we're going to see that fight if Sugar no. Sean wins against Marab Dewalish, really. And I'll tell you why. 
Umar Namagomedov might be one of the most difficult matchups for Sugar Sean. We saw before he accepted the fight with Marab Dawalish Willie uh, when he won his last fight that he called out um, Ilya Taporia. Right. Ilya Taporia has now got a dance partner, and it's all happening around the same time that Sean O'Malley's fighting Marab in the sphere. Right. You have a massive event in the sphere. You have a massive event in Abu Dhabi that right. was supposed to be Islam's main event, but he's injured. So now we have Ilya versus Max. Either way, the winner of that fight is a megastar. Max is already a megastar. Right. He's got the BMF belt. Everybody loves Max Holloway, and Max Holloway has the type of style that Sean would want to match up against. He doesn't want to go and, and be held down and all that. Ilya Taporia, with a win over Max Holloway, especially if it's a knockout like he's calling it, is saying it's going to be, he's he's a megastar at that point. You not, If you're the first guy to knock out Max Holloway, or even if you just beat Max Holloway in dominant fashion, you are the next UFC kind of rising star. You're a top five draw in, in the sport, at least top seven draw. Right. So if Ilya is able to get the jump, Sean's going to want that fight, of course. If Max gets the jump, Sean's not only going to want to fight for champ champ, he's going to want to fight for champ 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 because you have the BMF and you have the the 145 belt. Right. And Sean is, you know, there's he makes no bones about it. He's in this sport to make money. He knows how to draw eyeballs to himself. Right. He knows how to make people click buy on the pay-per-view button when when it's time to do that on a Saturday night. And he likes the fact that certain people hate him. He yeah. he enjoys being the heel. He Max Holloway's a fan favorite. I don't know any UFC fan that doesn't like Max Holloway. Right. He'd love to go in there and, and be the guy who hears some booze. And the, that, that's Sean O'Malley. That is Sugar Sean. Right. That's what's made him who he is. But make no mistake about it, he's a top-level fighter. And he's sure. shown that a few times. He's the champion now. And I think everybody pretty much believes in his skill, even if you don't like his persona. But Umar is a very difficult fight for him because for sure. of the grappling aspect. So I think I say all that, and I know it's a bit of a long-winded answer, but I say all that to essentially say I think that if Sean beats Marab, it might potentially be the last time we see Sean at 135. Oh, because yeah. you have Umar coming up. You know, you have so men, so much talent at 135. It's such a deep division. You know, what do you wait for for Davison to see if he can win a few more fights? Like, those right. are not big draws. And Sean O'Malley, even though he's a slender guy, he's a very tall guy for 135. Mm -hmm. So as he gets older, you know, he's approaching 30 years old now. As he starts to fill out his frame, it's going to make more sense for him to be at 145, and that's where the bigger fights are, at least at this present moment. So I think that Sean, if he gets the jump on Marab, looks straight up to 145 for the winner of Max versus Taporia. Which would be ultra exciting. And like you said, he's talked to the, uh, you know, he knows how to draw attention. And he understands that there's some hot names at 145 right now. But that's not the only time he's hinted at the, the featherweight division. Yeah, He has been kind of talking about moving up for years. He's like, you know, eventually it's going to be hard for me to make 35 and then I'll, I'll eventually move up. It seems like now's the time. We've got the, the right people. And it, it was kind of funny. He was like, uh, if Taporia wins, I'll go up and fight 45. But if, if Volk wins, I'm not going to go up there because he was kind of showing, showing yeah, respect Volk. To, go to Volk. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, I think that's pretty cool. But I, I wouldn't uh, sell your skills short because I think Sugar Sean, I get a lot of crap for saying this. I think he's the best striker in the entire UFC. And the UFC has the best talent in the entire world of mixed martial arts. So I think Sugar Sean right now is the highest level striker in the world. And I if you if you go back and, and you watch the the Max Holloway fight against Justin Gaethje, there's really nothing negative you can pull out of what Max yeah. Holloway did. But there are some some parts of me where I feel like th their styles would really mesh for a perfect fight. It'd be a lot of fun for the fans, and I think both of them would win rounds. I yeah. I, I, I don't think Sugar Sean's just going to go up to 45 to get his ass kicked. I think he's going to go up there to actually become either the champion or a real name in the division. And I'm with you. I think if he goes up to 45, he's going to be like everybody else that moves up a division. They're like, you know what? That weight cut really did suck. And, and once you start to plan for 10 to 10 pounds more than what you've been planning for, you do put on a couple extra pounds. You you bulk up in the offseason, you bulk up during camp, and then you cut the weight, and it's not near as, as difficult. So I think Sugar Sean might be looking at the featherweight division as a new permanent home. And it's really great that you say, Umar Magomedov comes in, he's got a fresh steam behind him, and, and he looks like a million bucks. He looks like he could be the top contender and likely would be either even money 
or potentially a slight favorite over Sugar. Yeah, because, I think he'd be a favorite. Yeah, it, it, it'd be a close money line, but I do think people see the name Nurmagomedov, they understand. And even though Sugar Sean is lethal with his striking, he hasn't shown us really any hiccups in his in his game in his entire UFC career. When you see that last name Nurmagomedov and you know that Sugar Sean is a polarizing character that does all the promotional stuff, you always sort of look at those guys as... Uh, I don't want to say hacks, but you look at them as like uh, characters. You, yeah. you don't think they're at the elite level until they go out there and beat everybody that they beat and they, they're undefeated right, on their right. rise. So I, I feel like Sugar Sean, he gets that sort of light sh- shined on him, but he goes out there and performs the way he does, always gets his hand raised. So I, I think Umar Namagomedov is something he would, somebody he would love to have on his resume at some point. But I don't think it's it's make or break for him. It's not like Umar's a legend of the division and he's done this crazy body of work and now he wants to get this legend under his under his belt. I think Umar Magomedov has his own career, his own uh, trajectory that he has to deal with. And if he becomes a major star in the sport, then it makes sense for him to to, to fight Sugar Sean. But if Sugar inserts himself into featherweight, he's automatically going right into a title shot. He's one of the biggest stars in the sport. He knows how to promote. He knows how to draw attention to himself. And I think Max Holloway would be chomping at the bit for that fight because I think he thinks he would be able to, to, to get the younger, smaller guy out of there. And I also think that Ilya Taporia would love that because Ilya understands the promotional side of the fight. And he knows, like... I need to get my name attached to these big names because yeah. Ilya is a big star. I think Spain has one that's going to become something very special for them, but he has to get in the octagon with some big names. He was calling for Conor McGregor, and everybody sort of laughed that off, and that's not going to happen. I don't really see that happening ever. Uh, yeah, n- yeah. I just don't see what weight class that would happen. I don't right. see Ilya going up to 70, and I really don't think Conor's ever going back down to 55 again, certainly right. not 45. Right, so you look at the landscape of 35, 45, 55, all the divisions that Ilya could potentially touch. And Sugar Sean, far and away, is the biggest name, the biggest star that he could possibly draw into. So yeah. Ilya is probably really hoping that Sugar Sean takes the bait and comes up to 45. But Max Holloway, for sure, would be thinking the same thing. And Sugar Sean, I'm not going to say he has no chance in that fight. I think he actually has a very good chance to beat both of those guys because his, the speed that he would bring up there finishing either one of those guys would be difficult, but he does have a good style and he's really learning how to pace himself through five rounds. He knows when to turn the jets on. He knows when to pull back and he knows when to get on his bike and, and kind of move around the octagon, use every square inch that he needs to. I think he would love to see Max Holloway in there because he knows he's not going to worry about takedowns or anything like that. He's going to go out there and show his skills, his best skills versus Max Holloway's best skills. And that's the kind of fight that the fans love to see. And people like Max Holloway and and Sugar Sean, who are both massive MMA fans and UFC fans themselves, they know the fans want to see that kind of stuff. And they want to deliver those types of performances while they're still in their UFC career. So, yeah, I, I love that idea. And I don't think that's a crazy thing to think. I think... Sugar Sean is one of those guys that wants the biggest name. He wants the biggest fights possible, but he also cares about respect uh, amongst his colleagues and uh, respect in the back room by all the fighters. And if he can go out there and keep beating these big names, then that's great. But then people will always say, oh, well, you didn't fight Umar. So I think Umar would wind up finding Sugar Sean again at some point. But if I was Sugar, I wouldn't wait around in the Bantamweight division. I'd let some more... uh, just traction take place down there at 135 and since you're the hottest name in the sport right now one of the most active hottest active fighters in the game right now and you got two guys at at 45 that want to fight you and it makes sense for you to go up there that that's all sugar sean needs i think the ufc would see that clear as day and since the schedules line up the sphere and max holloway and taporia's fight are not too far off from each other sometime early next year you could make that fight who knows? It could be in Spain if Ilya gets it yeah. done. You know, the UFC is now talking about they'd love to go over there. And sh- one thing you have is when you have a, a, a nation that's behind a fighter like Spain is with Ilya Taporia, and you're really trying to make a statement going over to a new country and, and putting on a big show, you need an international star as well. And Sugar Sean for the UFC right now is one of the top draws uh, as far as international stars. So I think Sugar Sean moving to 45 is a brilliant idea. 
Yeah, I, I think that the writing's on the wall. I'm pretty sure he's if he gets past Marab, that's what he's going to want to do. It's just th- like you said that you know Max Holloway is one of the biggest names Ilya could draw into. The same can be said for Ilya to Max, you right. know, vice versa. And and then you have to throw Sean in the mix because there's really no massive names at bantamweight anymore right now. And so right. those three guys are within a weight class of each other, and they're the three biggest names. And now we know that Volk is probably going to fight Justin Gaethje, right. you know, at UFC 309. I think they're saying so. Volk's not going to be fighting for the 145 belt anytime soon. I think Volk is ready to have some fun at this point in his career. But I want to move on to the next big fight that's coming up, which we already have some clarity on. That's DDP versus Israel Adesanya. Great fight. Israel Adesanya um, has not fought in almost a year. And the last time we saw him, he was dominated uh, on the feet, right. doing what he does best by Sean Strickland. Then we saw Sean Strickland move into fighting Drickus Duplessis in his first title defense. Many folks, myself included, thought Sean won that fight. Me too. I'm not saying it was a robbery, but I think that Sean Strickland did enough to get his hand raised in that fight. So yeah. DDP is coming into this fight with a bit of a chip on his shoulder. Right. DDP is a very interesting fighter to me. He has a ton of power, clearly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. His grappling is very good. I have to call it how I see it. The way he strikes and the way he moves to me is a little bit awkward. It's a little bit clunky, and he is available to get hit. So I think Adesanya has a really good chance in this fight, and I think the odds makers are kind of thinking along the same lines as I'm thinking because Izzy's actually, even though he's coming off a loss and even though we haven't seen him in, in, in a year, and DDP is on very much a hot streak right now, is he still a slight favorite? It's almost a pick 'em, but is he is like a minus 145? Right. Last time I checked the odds before we started rolling the cameras today. So that's interesting to me, the fact that, that the odds makers do have it as a favorite for Adesanya. But I think they're kind of looking back to some of Izzy's performances against big, strong guys that hit hard, have that one punch knockout power. You know, Yoel Romero. Paulo phenomenal Costa. grappler, mm-hmm. grappler Paulo Costa. You know, all he's not the wrestler that Romero is, but he certainly has one punch knockout power. And Izzy, those types of fighters cater right into Izzy's game. Right. Sean Strickland is a smother you with boxing, super high pace, excellent cardio, not giving you the space that you need to do what you need to do. So, but the other side of that coin is DDP is damn near the size of a two hundred five er. Yeah. And when Izzy went up to 205 to fight Jan Blahovich, he was outstruck. Although I think Izzy may have thrown more shots. Jan certainly right. landed the better shots and the more, more damaging shots. And he was kind of dominated in the grappling realm as well, which we know DDP has a phenomenal submission game. Yeah. So to me, this fight, and I'm going to try to devise a prediction before we finish talking about it, but yeah. it's, it's, I keep going back and forth on it. What are your thoughts from a technical standpoint, and do you dare to make a prediction? I'm, I, I will make my prediction. Yeah. I'm very excited for Izzy's return. Izzy, when the, the world of MMA is a better world when Izzy's competing. And look, he deserved that break. The, nobody was as active of a champion as Israel Adesanya. Not even close. At least not in the modern era. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you could go back to the early 2000s and find somebody who was who was fighting as consistently as Izzy. Yeah. But Izzy goes out there, he he shows us, and look, he fought Alex Pereira, and now they have both beat each other in MMA. Alex Pereira seems like an unstoppable force right now. So you have to remember, Izzy beat him. He, he finished yeah. him, right? Like, this is incredible. Izzy is still absolutely, I just said a second ago, Sugar Sean's the best striker in MMA. It's 1A and 1B for, for Izzy, in yeah. my opinion. And I think, Pereira, and right. potentially Taporia. Yeah. Right, right. But, but like you said, with uh, the awkward style of DDP, and I love that because Pereira very much is an awkward fighter as well. But you have to you have to call it awkward, but you can't call it wrong because if it's effective, then it obviously works. It's right, right. Yeah. It's, it's it's right. Even if it looks ugly, even if he's falling all over himself, you know, if you've got a a baseball player and he's a pitcher and he's really really good, but he you know he stands up like this and throws the ball through his legs, yeah, <laughs> you know. It, as long as he's going through the strike zone. If he's throwing zone, 100 mile an hour fastballs, then what can you say? You exactly. Know? You can't really critique the, the the technique. So while, yes, I could sit here and, and poke holes in DDP's uh, striking style, I'm only going to poke holes from a traditional striker standpoint. Like uh, DDP does a lot of things wrong, but they work for him. So they're just wrong 
uh, optically. They yeah. actually work very well and they're effective and he's able to generate enough power to get get the finishes that he needs to do. And if he has to take the fight to the ground, he can do that. So uh, DDP is one of those guys that is so awkward that it probably does take a couple of rounds to really get a good read on him. And all the while, while you're figuring out what he's doing, he's stealing those first couple of rounds yeah. from you because he comes out with a pretty aggressive style and you don't want to just jump into a firefight with him because the one punch knockout power that you were referring to, he can put the lights out. So Izzy's a very calculated fighter. He's willing to get into a firefight. He's willing to engage in, in, in the fire with somebody and even guys who hit harder than him or seem to be more power punchers than Izzy. He's willing to get in there, but not until he understands where the danger is when he's inside with on you. his terms, yeah. right? Yeah. Engage on your own terms. And he did that with Alex Pereira. He even knew exactly how to draw him in. And I could see a similar motion that, uh, out of Izzy for DDP. You know, you get somebody like Alex Pereira or, or DDP to think that there's blood in the water and then they swarm you and they're just looking to get that fight finished as quickly as possible. I Israel Adesanya knows he can stay cool as a cucumber in that fire exchange and find those clean shots. And with his speed, his accuracy, and his timing, plus the defense that he's able to showcase, I think he could wind up catching DDP. And I feel like Izzy 2.0 is about to remer uh, uh, emerge out of nowhere. He's going to come back. People were talking about uh, it's going to be five years till we see Izzy, and that was a little bit yeah. of trolling on his part. But I, I really do think that the best thing Izzy can do is get back in there. He, d he belongs in nothing but title fights, and it makes a lot of sense to me to see DDP go out there and Izzy. I know it's not in Africa, but this could be the start. Of, of the, the next trilogy. great trilogy yeah. for Israel Adesanya. I just feel like there's something there. And Izzy's such a good character for the sport. He knows how to really evoke emotions, not only out of uh, the, the fans that are watching the story uh, unfold, but also his opponent. He knows how to draw the reactions out of him. He was flustering uh, uh, DDP a bit in the ring that one night. You know, yeah. things got a little bit heated, and that's why they sort of pushed that fight along the road. But this fight to me is very interesting. And the other addition to the to the entire uh, equation is the Alex Pereira, uh, you know, anomaly. Because yes, he's not in their division right now, but Israel Adesanya has business with Alex Pereira, and only a fool would think that we're not going to see a trilogy between those two. And if it if a DDP. Uh, loses this fight and loses his belt to Izzy, I don't think Izzy's next fight will take place at 185. I think with the dust settling and everything happening at 205 the way it is, I think they're going to need to have another star emerge. Now we've got Rakic and, and, and Magomed yeah. fighting each other, who Magomed should have been the number one contender, but clearly that's not, not the direction the UFC is going. And then you hear the UFC say, we're not making another fight for Alex Pereira until after we get the results of DDP versus Izzy, which kind of tells you everything you need to know. Uh, they won't, they aren't even really hiding it. We want to see the winner of that fight move up for champ champ status. Izzy already had one crack of that. He wasn't successful, but now he's actually got a win over the current champion. And I also think when you have DDP, who's a very big guy, like you said, probably belongs at 205. I think he was only at 185 for the beginning of his career because he saw a good path to the to the title. I think DDP is going to finish out his career at 205. I think it's going to be uh, a, a very interesting path for DDP. If I'm going to give you my prediction, I think Izzy goes out there and cleans him up. I think he's a far better striker. I think DDP is awkward, and that does work sometimes. And when you don't see things coming or they come from awkward angles, they can catch you. But Israel is so buttoned up. He's so calculated, and he stays very calm until he has a good read on you. So I think DDP, like you said, is a perfect stylistic matchup for Izzy. I think it's actually going to be one of the easier fights for Israel Adesanya. And he's figured out how to dissect an awkward fighter like and Alex Pereira. So I think he knows exactly what he needs to do to go out there and beat DDP, get his belt back. And I think he's going to point all of his cannons right at Alex Pereira, go for the guy, go for the trilogy, go for the, another awkward fighter. But I guess we can say if that doesn't happen and DDP does win the fight, I would be equally interested in seeing uh, uh, Alex Pereira fight uh, DDP because DDP is so awkward and Alex is so awkward that I, I truly don't know how that fight would go. I yeah. would assume DDP would try to take it to the ground at some point because people still seem to think that there's a pretty big hole in the game of Alex Pereira's grappling. But 
as the as the years pass by and the months pass by, he's making crazy improvements. Now he's showing footage of him training grappling and and there's there's a lot of technique that he's displaying and he seems to be a pretty legit grappler i know they gave him that black belt in the octagon for god only knows what reason but after a knockout yeah yeah i don't think anybody's gonna gonna try to question his black belt so i'd love to see either fight but if you're asking me my prediction ddp is going to get finished just like some of the other big heavy punchers that israel's fought in his past and i think israel is going to go right up for that trilogy against alex Interesting. You know, and, and I've gone back and forth on this fight, and I'll just kind of give you my thoughts on where each of them has an advantage. Okay. Precision and technical striking, Adesanya. Yeah. Power, DDP. Yeah. Clearly. DDP is going to have a power advantage and a strength advantage over Adesanya. He's big. He's extremely strong. Yeah. People that have grappled with him have said that the way he feels on the mat, he feels like a heavyweight. He's yeah. extraordinarily powerful. He's extraordinarily strong. He does have that awkward cadence. Confidence. Israel has been one of the most confident fighters in the UFC for several years, right. for, for, for at least three years now. Um, DDP can match him on yeah. confidence, and DDP's on a win streak. Izzy is started, has just has a, a, the first of his losing streak. Right. So... I'm leaning more towards Drickus. Really? And, it, and, I, and I wasn't leaning that way just a couple of days ago, but I went back and I watched some of his fights. And yes, he's awkward, but he's not Romero and he's not Costa. No. He's more skilled as far as submissions go than both Costa and Romero. For sure. I believe that his top pressure jujitsu, he's not the wrestler that Yoel Romero is, certainly not by a long stretch, but I believe his top pressure jujitsu and his advancement you know position leading to submission gives him the highest chance of those three gentlemen to have submitted adesanya so um i think you have to you have to factor in that a submission could be there and i think that he just is going to be able to find a shot that kind of frazzles is he yeah and i think that he's going to if he's smart go back and watch the jan blahovich fight because he's got a similar, but he might even be bigger than Jan, yeah. to be honest. He's got a very similar body frame, big, strong, you know, great grappling. If he, if, if Jan can do what he did to Izzy, D- I believe D- yeah. DDP can too. So I'm going to pick DDP to to win this fight wow. um, by submission. Okay. Probably in the third or fourth round. I think, and, and I do think you're right. I think the first round, Izzy's going to be cerebral. It's going to be hard for Drickus to find his entries, and Izzy's probably going to win the first and second round. But, you know, I've picked against Drickus before a couple of times and I've been wrong. Yeah. I'm not going to be on the wrong side of this one. I, I do think DDP gets it done. And that would kill the potential trilogy that you mentioned for Israel and DDP. Yeah. Because the trilogy only works if Israel wins. Right. If Israel loses, then he's on a two-fight losing streak. How yeah. does he get back to the title to fight DDP again? He's fighting a Homs out of that. Point. Right. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to use him. You know, Izzy's in his you know late thirties now, and so you know the the thirty five curse, which by the way, Bilal Muhammad just broke that curse. But uh, you know, it was typically for one seventy and below, one eighty five and above does not typically um, suffer the same type of fates as thirty five plus fighters do. And so I think if Izzy does lose to DDP, there's still some fun to be had for Adesanya. For he sure. could always try to go make a run at two hundred five and see what can happen there. You know, they're probably going to throw him the Hamzats and the people like that. Um, you know, that that's just the nature of the game. Yeah. Unless Hamzat beats Whitaker and then they they fast track him to a title shot, which is a whole different discussion, especially after Whitaker's last fight, which right. we'll have to park that discussion for another podcast. Right. But, you know, I, I really think that Drickus is going to get this done. And then I think he's going to call out Pereira. Yeah. And they said, the UFC said, we're not making Alex's fight. And I want to talk a little bit about Magomed and, and Rakic here in a second, because that to me clearly indicates that they've got a bigger plan for Alex. Yeah. Because if Magomed, Magomed and Kalayev's the Marab Dualish Willie of 205, he's the undeniable number one contender. He should be fighting Pereira next. Right. But he's fighting a guy that just got knocked out by Yuri, who yeah. just got knocked out by Alex. So like, what what's that, what's that all about? Right. So... They're waiting to see what happens. I think they're waiting to see if Izzy beats DDP. Yeah. 
And if my prediction's wrong, which it could be, and Izzy loses or Izzy beats DDP, they're going to make that trilogy at 205. Izzy's been a big star in the, in the sport for a while. He wanted that champ champ status. He went up once. He he put on a good fight, but he but he came up short. Yeah. They're going to give him that opportunity again against his old foe to make it right in the rubber match in, in MMA. I know what happened in kickboxing, but I'm talking about yeah. MMA. They're one and one. You know, it makes the most sense. Each yeah. finished each other. Either that or they're looking at Tom versus Alex yeah. to fight the winner of John versus Stipe. But one thing we know for sure is that they're not looking at Alex to fight um, to, to fight Magomed and Goliath, at least not right now. So, but, so DDP is going to call Alex out if he yeah. wins. But I don't think that's the right fight. I think Sean Strickland deserves his rematch. He does. Sean Strickland has looked good since he, he fought DDP and lost his belt. A lot of people, including myself, thought that he edged out a victory. Again, not a robbery. Like, people throw around robbery a little bit too much, in my opinion, and there are some clear robberies. That was not one of them. But I still think Sean Strickland won that fight. So Sean definitely deserves his rematch against DDP, and that's what I would like to see. For DDP to, you know, eke out a victory against Sean Strickland and win the belt and then beat Adesanya, who's coming off a loss, you you won a con- you won the belt in controversy and you beat a guy coming off a loss. Yeah. You don't really get to be a champ champ with right. that type of resume. You need to win, you know, one or two more. Maybe a Hamzat comes up. Maybe it's somebody else. Maybe Bo Nickel goes on a run. You know, Never who, know. who knows what they're going to do with him. But I think DDP needs to stay at 185 and make it right with Sean Strickland if he if he wins the belt. Or yeah. if, if he retains his belt, I should say. Yeah, I agree. I think Sean Strickland's still very much a meaningful character, and he doesn't have to do anything else. I think he should just wait in line and fight whoever wins the belt or you know figure out if, if it's an interim situation, if Izzy moves up or whatever. I think that's that's definitely the right move. And, you know, I'll, I'll push back real quick on you before we move on. Uh, Israel versus ZDP is interesting. And, and like you said, he's not the, the wrestler that a Yoel Romero is, but he knows how to, to, to grapple really well. The key to grappling is you have to get the fight to the ground. And his best chance of doing that is pushing Israel to the cage and then somehow dragging him down with a body lock or some sort of uh, some sort of takedown. But you have to remember, Israel has been having wrestlers go for his legs, go for his body, put him up against the cage for years now. And almost nobody has as good of takedown defense up against the cage as Israel Adesanya. He's very good there. And so while I am not going to say there's 0% chance that this fight takes place at all on the ground i don't see much happening on the ground between izzy and ddp i think it's going to be a striking match and that's largely because uh, ddp doesn't have the wrestling pr- uh, prowess to get israel to the ground and i think israel's so good at keeping it striking that he's just going to want to do that and shortly after uh, the first couple rounds then the shots become more difficult to get and israel starts to pick up on you a little bit more but you know we could break all that yeah, down a little that's bit that's interesting yeah, yeah I, I, I think it's gonna i think it might be more similar to the blahovich fight than you think but yeah. i could be i mean you're right. Izzy is hard to take down. Yeah. You know, I mean, Yoel Romero, the, well, you know, top level wrestler, didn't take him down. So. Right, right. And and you have to remember, Jan Blahovich, the one thing that uh, gave him the advantage over Israel Asanya and the reason he got his hand raised was the size and the power. And that, like you said, DDP carries some of that size and power as well. So if he's able to utilize the same uh, tools that Jan Blahovich did, then I think we could see the fight take place on the ground and then his chances go up significantly. But I'm leaning towards Israel being able to keep this fight on the feet and get his hand raised probably by a TKO finish. I think he's going to come back. The, the walkout's going to be insane. Of course, he's going to want to be on a hot microphone with with, with Joe Rogan. or yeah. I don't know. If it's in Australia, Joe Rogan's not going to be there. But I think Israel... DC Adesanya, probably, yeah. Yeah, I think Izzy 2.0 is about to come out. It's going to be a whole different thing, and we're going to see him go for champ champ status and and dare to be great once more. And, and Israel Adesanya just does so many things right in the sport that I can't bet against him. And like you said, I thought Sean Strickland won this fight uh, uh, against DDP, and I don't really see... Uh, Israel Adesanya being uh, being pressed by too much of, of the tools and the offense that DDP has to offer. Interesting. So I want to talk a little Alex Pereira because he's been very much in the news and it's been for not so great things. Right. He's got a little bit of controversy and sometimes that comes with, you know, having more fame. But yep. before we do that, we would be remiss to not talk about Hamzat versus Robert Whitaker because we've been a lot of discussion in this episode has been about Izzy versus DDP. Right. And Hamzat versus Whitaker was made and the timeline is going to match up perfectly right. with the winner of this fight. So, you know, we do say that Sean Strickland deserves that rematch, 
but you got to think it's not always fair in the world of UFC and right. MMA. The world of yeah. what have you done for me lately? If Hamzat Jemayev can get out there and, and finish Robert Whitaker, I think um, you know they'll probably thrust him into the next title shot. Be, However, yeah. Robert Whitaker is no easy night of work. And no. he showed, I don't know how many times Robert needs to show that before people realize it, yeah. but like Ikram um, Alaskarov, Beast. everybody thought that he was going to just beat Robert Whitaker. I mean, not everybody, but most people thought that he was going to get the jump on Bobby Knuckles. He was the favorite. And Robert just lit him up. Yeah. He made it look easy. His striking was you know, levels above that yeah. of Alaskarov. And Alaskarov's got a bright future. He's going to be a good fighter. But to think that Robert Whitaker is not going to give Hamzat Chemaev some trouble would be a, a wrong line of thinking. Oh, because yeah. Robert Whitaker is going to be the toughest fight of Hamzat Chemaev's life. Yeah. I want to get your thoughts on how that fight could potentially play out, what Hamzat needs to do in order to win, because Robert Whitaker, we know, is extremely dynamic on the feet. Yes. He's hung in... I mean, aside from the first fight with Izzy, he's hung in there and and shown that he can really strike with the best of the best at 185. He's very crafty. He does have great wrestling defense. He's shown that he can prevent the takedowns from happening to him. And not just that, he can make the opponent that's trying to take him down seriously pay for the attempt for sure. when, when the exchange is, is, is breaking. So what are your thoughts on Hamzat versus Whitaker? It, I hope it happens this time. Hamzat really needs to have a fight booked and actually get in there and have it happen, or he's going to lose all of his steam that yeah. he has. But thoughts on the fight and and how do you see Hamzat having a potential good night well yeah and you hate for that hate that for Hamzat because it's always health related it's yeah the, and and the the craziest part about the health reasons is because he trains too hard he's like a freak in the gym yeah. he never stops he doesn't give his body the proper rest it needs and that's why he's not able to fight so uh, I think Hamzat Jemayev has a little bit of growing to do uh, as far as uh, learning how to, to taper back a little bit. And I don't think he needs to lose the tenacity that he has. And obviously he's in the gym every day working very hard, sometimes too hard. But it, it does make sense now that you're you, you're not just a, a rising star. You're now a, a contender. Yeah. And you're atten- essentially one fight away from becoming uh, uh, getting into a title fight, potentially becoming a champion. So I think Hamzat Chemaev really needs to understand that, like, let's let's button this thing up. Let's treat it as professionally as possible. Robert Whitaker is going to be the hardest fight he's ever had in his life. I can't really say on paper that uh, Hamzat's going to be the hardest fight for Robert Whitaker because he's no, been... he's fought a, everybody. He's yeah. been a world champion. He's fought the former champions, current champions, and everybody in between. And unless you're Israel Adesanya or DDP, you're not beating Robert Whitaker. Yeah. And I honestly think after all the brilliant performances Robert Whitaker has had, that fight with uh, uh, Alice Garov was probably his most impressive performance, at least in recent memory. You know, he's he, he just looked flawless out there. Yeah. So Hamzat Chemaev, if he would have taken uh, one more fight uh, earlier this summer and he wouldn't have backed out of that one and looked really good doing it, I think my my thought would be a little bit different. I'd to say, look, I love Robert Whitaker, but I think Hamzat's a, for, a future champion, and just like the other future champions that were able to beat Robert Whitaker, he'll be able to do the same. But the fact that he hasn't been as active and the fact that Robert Whitaker looks better than he ever has, and he's also not that much older than, uh, than, than, than Hamzat, yep. I think that Robert Whitaker has a really good chance. He's his body, his conditioning, and his style are perfectly primed for five round fights. And I can't say the same thing for for Hamzat just because we haven't seen him in the five round atmosphere. Yeah. Just like you know, when you when you've got somebody like Robert Whitaker who's been in nothing but five round fights for years and years now. I mean, a couple of them have been three rounders, but you watch him at the end of those, and you're like, man, this guy could for sure go two more rounds. He's got so much gas left, yeah. and he's throwing crazy volume. So. I think Hamzat Jemayev can't go out there with the same game plan he had against a Kevin Holland or against a Gerald Mears Shard and just walk uh, walk Robert Whitaker down. No. He's got to be a little bit more calculated and precise. I do believe in in his wrestling ability. I think he could get Robert to the ground, but you have to remember Robert, like he was a national uh, national champion wrestler out of Australia, which isn't the pedigree of Chechnya right. or America, but he certainly knows his wrestling and now that he's evolved it into an MMA style of wrestling he be, he has become very difficult to take to the ground and he's it, he's also quite good at counter wrestling and and switching the positions on you so i don't think Hamzat can just take this fight to the ground when he wants to i think he's going to have to strike 
with Robert Whitaker for the majority of this fight. Yeah. And that's a tall order. Hamzat's clearly a very good striker. And if you watch him in practice, in sparring, he's doing things that are very interesting and very difficult to read and, and understand. But when he goes out in the fight, he sort of puts the, the extracurriculars to the side and sticks to fundamentals. But his volume isn't quite the, the level of Robert Whitaker's. Yeah. Robert does come at you with all sorts of uh, weapons. He'll, he'll throw crazy kicks. He'll slide in with some up elbows and whatnot. He's yeah. very good in that karate stance, which is ultra bladed and not great for leg kicks. But I don't think he has to worry about Hamzat chopping his calves or yeah. his legs all that much. Hamzat likes to throw his hands to set up his shots. And I think... Robert Whitaker can go out there and really surprise him. You know, we saw like Gilbert Burns go out there and find a lot of success. And Gilbert Burns and Robert Whitaker, uh, body frame wise, are, are very similar. Their fighting style is different, but at least the, the size and, and everything is going to be similar. So I think Robert Whitaker goes out there with a pretty good chance of getting his hand raised. It's five, it's five rounds, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a five round fight. There's title implications. Actually, on the I, line. I believe it's five. I can't, I can't confirm that. Well, if yeah. it's three rounds, uh, my, my opinion probably sways a little bit more towards Hamzat getting his hand raised. If it's a five round fight, I think Robert Whitaker wins. But now that you say that, I do think it might actually be a three rounder. And that does change things because Robert's going to have to get out there and go. And Hamzat doesn't have to worry quite as much about his gas tank, which we've seen in the past. He ha he leaves nothing else on on the table. He yeah. fights at the red line. He floors it the entire time he's out there. And a lot of people look at that and they're like, oh man, Hamzat has no gas tank. I don't look at it that way. I think Hamzat Chemaev is a human and no human can sprint for 15 minutes, let alone 25 uh, so I think Hamzat Chemaev is just the kind of guy that's a very entertaining fighter. He wants to give the fans great fights. He wants to get his hand raised. He's ultra competitive, and he doesn't feel like he can let off the gas for a second for these people to get some sort of advantage on him, which is a brilliant mindset to have for the game, but it can leave you susceptible to gassing out, and you don't want to be left with no gas, no energy with a guy like Robert Whitaker in there because he's shown us time and time again over years now that he doesn't get tired, that he knows how to pace himself, position himself well to win rounds. And look, this is the hardest fight for Hamdat Chemaev by a country mile. And if he's able to get his hand raised on this, I'm with you. I think he might do a little bit of line jumping. I wouldn't really want to see him go in there and fight Sean Strickland only because I don't think Sean Strickland needs to do any more heavy lifting. But at the same time, Hamzat Chemaev is the biggest you know, new prospect and he's, he's ha had so much steam on him for so long and they don't really know how long his career is going to go. It's sort of been one of those awkward careers where, hell, we just got to use this guy while we have him because we don't know where, where he's going to be three years from yeah. now. And I think Hamzat Chemaev might wind up inserting himself in the title implications if he can get his hand raised against Robert. But of course, easier said than done. Yeah, and I think Robert's going to win that fight. Yeah, um, I'll just I won't bury the lead. I Let's think go. I, I, my prediction is Robert Whitaker because I mean, look, Gilbert Burns, you, you had success. Oh yeah, Gilbert Burns has spent most of his career at one fifty five. Robert True. Whitaker, you know, yes, Robert Whitaker fought at seventy, but he saw the most success. He became a champion at one eighty five. Right. You're talking about guys that had the bulk of their careers two weight classes apart from each other, mm -hmm. and I know that Robert's not the biggest, um, you know, one eighty five er on the planet, but he's very crafty. He's a vet and he's very strong and his speed is crazy yeah and and, and hamza yes he is multi-dimensional when you see him on the pads and seeing him in the training room but as you said when he gets in a fight it's ones and twos he yeah. uses boxing to set up his shots he throws kicks every now and then i've mm -hmm. seen him do one crazy thing where he threw a head kick and then turned it into a double leg which brilliant. is a brilliant and very bizarre sequence to do um they definitely don't teach that in most mma classes yeah. try that on a heavy bag and just see how difficult it actually yeah. is to get your foot all the way up to the top where the head would be and then back in place to to then run your feet and shoot a shot yeah i mean he, he's he's supremely talented yeah. but robert whitaker's a, a true veteran of the sport yeah he knows how to win rounds he knows how to how to how to work that anti-wrestling game he knows how to make opponents pay when they shoot in on him and and don't get the takedown right and he's also very composed on the ground robert whitaker's been taken down before I mean, he's been able to keep himself composed and get himself back to his feet and, you know, do well. So I think Hamzat Chemaev is going to have a lot to deal with on the feet. Yeah. And his success in proving my prediction to be an incorrect one is going to be whether or not he can hold Whitaker on the ground. Yeah. He's got to get him there and he's got to hold him there. I think if this fight is a stand up fight, Robert cleans him up. Yeah. I think those uppercuts he was landing on Alaskarov. 
the shot selection when he had him hurt, those high kicks from close range, chopping the leg, that in and out karate stance. I, I don't think Hamzat is even remotely close to Whitaker as far as striking is concerned. Fair. And I think that Hamzat's best chance is just massive damage on the ground. Yeah, he's gotta he's gotta throw a lot. And and one thing I'll add to that because I think you're you're spot on with that point. Uh I think Hamzat Chemaev, like we said, we were discussing the gas tank. He gives it all he's got. And one thing you don't want to do, and everybody understands this, is wrestling and grappling in MMA is the most exhausting aspect of the sport, whether you're on offense or defense. So I think that if Hamzat Chemaev wants to get this fight done, like you said, he doesn't need to test himself on the feet for the entire duration. He needs to get this fight to the ground. But... Don't just sit for position. I think you need to, to work serious damage with striking and ultimately start looking for submissions quickly because if you hold somebody for five minutes, and like you said, there are Robert Whitaker who can stay composed in the fire of a, of a grappling exchange, then you, you get up after that round ends and you start round two and now your arms are tired and now you can't throw your volume like you want to. And now maybe you were trying to put some hooks in with the legs and you've been doing some leg wrestling with him and you're trying to figure out how to, how to position yourself. You you could wind up getting very gassed and your opponent who was losing the round and on the bottom is saving his energy yeah. for, for when they get back on the feet and go for that exchange. So yeah, that's a risky thing. I think if Hamzat takes it to the ground, he's got to look for those finishes quickly. Yeah, interesting. Do you do you have an early prediction or are you not going to make it yet? Yeah, I, th I think Hamzat Chemayev wins. And uh, if it's three rounds... <sighs> I don't Grounds really, definitely favors yeah. him. I, I don't see uh, Robert Whitaker getting finished by him because I don't think yeah, his striking is dynamic enough. And I think Robert's wrestling is good enough to negate some of it, but sort of like the Umar versus Corey thing. If, if Hamzat can go out there and take him down two times per round and hold him down for a minute or 45 seconds each time, then Robert Whitaker's going to have to play defense, which doesn't bode well in the judges' eyes, and you've you, you got to start giving rounds to Hamzat Chemaev. So I'm going to go Hamzat Chemaev, but by decision. Another great learning experience for him, and I think a necessary amount of time to be in the octagon before you start jumping into the title contention. Yeah, I mean, a win over Robert Whitaker certainly puts you in the discussion. I know Hamzat's had his ups and downs, and you know, with the fans, I don't think there's been a fighter that has been loved and hated so many times over by the fans very in recent polarizing. memory. He's a very polar one one minute everybody loves him the next everybody hates him yeah. and it's all based on his activity and, and what he does and what he's demanding and stuff like that true want to finish on a bit of what's you know going on in the news of mma right now okay. alex Pereira. so i don't know if you saw what came out there was a young lady that he spent some time with at ufc yeah, 302 fans. in new jersey mm -hmm. um yeah, as you said she's an of girl and She's come out and, and made some pretty strong claims, you know, certain words that I won't use here on this YouTube yeah. channel. But, you know, the question is, where is Alex's focus? Is, you know, we saw this with Conor McGregor. We see yeah. this with these fighters that eclipse this level of stardom. Right. And I'm not saying or suggesting that Alex did anything. And but before this whole podcast, we started rolling. Um, I did see a, a news article that the young lady that had put those videos out saying that, you know, Alex did what he did to her has since removed those videos. So go. I watched them. Some of the things she said didn't feel like they added up to me. You know, if you're uncomfortable with somebody, why are you going to five, six locations with them and going around, you know, just call for, it a night, you know, 12, 14 yeah. hours, right? You're spending the afternoon watching him train and then going to dinner and then going to the UFC hotel and then going to the fight. And to me, it didn't, it didn't make a whole lot of sense, but I think there's a greater point that we need to discuss here. And that's, is Alex Pereira falling into the trap of that mega stardom? Because uh. the truth of the matter is, you know, at Alex at his status right now, his age, he's got, you know, young kids that look to be in their early teenage years. They're coming up and they're training as well. Right. You have to you have to concern yourself with who you associate with. Yeah. You know, you can't just hang out with 20 year old social media content creator type of girls and not expect that at some point something like this comes up. Right. Whether whether anything happened or not, Alex could be completely innocent and this could be a money grab. Right. He could have there could have been some gray area with language and miscommunication because as she said he he did they didn't speak the same language. They right. didn't communicate but through a translator. So what are your thoughts on the whole situation? Does this tarnish Alex in any way? Do you think he's losing focus? And how does Pereira need to conduct himself now that he's a megastar? 
Well, it's it's very difficult. And first of all, I'm not qualified to give my opinion on these types of matters, but I will give my opinion just because nonetheless, this, yeah. this is what we do. It's an MMA fighter. He's in the MMA news and we don't get these types of stories all that often. But whenever you have a rising star, you have somebody who really does pop off in the world of uh, not just uh, MMA, but in pop culture, it things like this do start to happen. And I'm not going to say 100% of them aren't true, but it winds up being about 70, 80% of them are a bunch of smoke with no fire. And yeah. these girls are looking for opportunities or even guys, guys will do that sort of thing as well. They're looking for an opportunity, not only to either get a, a quick, cash grab off of somebody like that, but also build their own their name. platform. Right. right. I never, I don't know this girl's name. I still don't know this girl's name, but I'll tell you, she's, she's now tied to Alex Pereira, which the entire MMA community keeps an eye on. And now more people know who she is. I'm quite confident in saying her searches on OnlyFans or searches on Reddit or whatever have probably gone up a hundredfold since this yeah, news came no out. No question. And, and and look, the only thing I'll say about it, because I, I like I said, I want to keep this short and sweet since I don't know all the details and I wasn't there personally. Uh, it seems like they spent the entire day together. And if you listen to what she says from the very first time they met, which was at apparently a gym, it was awkward and she felt uncomfortable. Okay, so I've been awkward and uncomfortable in many situations in my life. I'm sure everybody watching has. Uh, if I'm really awkward and, and and feel uncomfortable in a situation, I remove myself from the situation and no no Call more it a day. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, if you're being held hostage, that might be a little bit more difficult to do. But right. from what I understand, Alex Ferreira didn't have her in some sort of dungeon right. under the gym or anything like that. And you know, they went to a nice meal after that. They went to the hotel lobby bar when they were drinking with UFC brass and UFC fighters alike. Everybody was there. They're in front of tons of eyes, and then they go to a sold out arena with twenty. 20,000 people, nothing weird happens there. You're getting the VIP yeah. treatment of your life. You'll probably never go to a sporting event to that magnitude and be treated like that much of a rock star ever again in your life. So you get all these things. And look, I'm not trying to say she didn't feel uh, awkward or uncomfortable in those situations, but she could have said, hey, at, at the UFC, uh, at the UFC event, I, I got to go to the bathroom. And then she could just ditch. She yeah. doesn't have to spend the night with him. And then after the fight takes place, then they go back to the hotel. And then eventually he pays a room, pays for her to get a room. And, you know, the we're all here because of procreation. That's what yeah. humans do with each other. So I feel like Alex Pereira probably thought there was a, a very pretty girl in front of him. We've been talking all day, hanging out, and we sort of made this arrangement. And we kind of knew what we were getting into. If she didn't want to do it, then she could have left the situation. And look, like I said, I'm not blaming her. I'm not blaming him. I hope the story comes out fully and whoever is lying or not being 100% truthful does get exposed for that. But I, if you're, if you're asking me my personal opinion, not like a prediction, I predict that Alex Pereira will come out of this unscathed. I don't think this is going to be a blemish on his career. And I think it's just one of those types of things that happens when you're, you're new to money, when you're new to fame, and when the world's watching you, it, there's obviously opportunities for people to grab. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it can be summed up by saying don't make yourself an easy target. There you go. When you're, when you're a, a champion of the world, when you're driving around in blue Lamborghinis and you got all the sponsors that money can buy – and you got people like Jake Paul calling you out. You're you're one of the most famous athletes in the world. I mean, yeah. it's it's safe to say that Alex Pereira is becoming certainly in the top two dozen most famous athletes in the world right oh, yeah. now. He's he's very very popular and the face of the yeah. UFC as far yeah. as active rosters. Go. And he's becoming not only is he very very popular, but he's becoming very very rich. Yeah. And when you have a lot of fame and you have a lot of money, you are a target. Right. And you have to live your life accordingly. You might not have asked for it, but that's where you are. Right. And so my opinion on the matter is I think Alex probably will learn from this. I think he needs to choose who he spends time with, right. at, you know, Keep a your little bit more carefully. Close. Keep your circle close. 20-year-old um, spicy content creators are probably not the best people to hang out with. Yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to put this in as light of a way as I possibly can. But I agree with you. I think Alex is probably going to come out of this unscathed, you know, pre preventing or provided that some more information doesn't come out that's really damning evidence against him. But to me, and, and the fact that she's now deleted the videos and stuff like that, it feels like this may have been 
a lot of smoke and no fire, as you said. Yeah, and even if she does delete it and they don't go towards a you know a, a court system to hear have a judge hear their situation, it still can benefit her financially because, like we said, she's being looked up now, and people understand that there's some girl out there, and then they want to figure out who it is. So th there's a way where she can still monetize off this, even if she doesn't get a dime of Alex Pereira's money or doesn't have to go yeah. through a court system. She's already she's already done the the the, the damage that she wanted to do as far as building her own stardom right and lucky you know whenever you get put in these situations there's nothing lucky that can come out of it but one good thing that comes out of this for alex Pereira is i believe he and his team moving forward will be a lot more buttoned up with who they allow in their inner circle yeah. and look you know alex Pereira has a very bright future i would hate to see something like this derail him especially because he's about 37 years old we don't need time off for alex Pereira. i hope nothing bad happened for for her or for him and and, and i hope the truth comes out and everybody settles. But just like every everything else, you know, you get this big, juicy article that comes out about you. And then if it all turns out fake, you don't get that same love. Recanting of the article. Yeah, you, you never, never you do. never get the you never get the walk back. Yeah, and, and no, nobody right. says sorry, we were wrong on that one. You just still get that major headline of uh, you know. Alex did something very horrible to somebody. And then 90% of the people that saw that don't end up seeing the small headline later down in small fine print. By the, the way, not true. Yeah, yeah, this was all false and allegations turned out to be untrue. So I think Alex Pereira is, this is a learning lesson for him. And, and like I said, I hope everybody is safe and, and, and wasn't harmed. But at the same time, I, I do, uh, the writing's on the wall a little bit. You, you know, I'm not going to paint this girl in the same brush as all the other people that do these types of things, but sometimes there's similarities between those types of people and their personalities. I think that's a perfect place to leave it. Guys, thanks so much for listening to this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Drop a like on the video if you haven't already. Hit that subscribe button and leave us a comment. What was your favorite part of the episode today? We'll see you next time. Peace.